All right, folks. We're hitting that hour of 7 o'clock. Glad that everybody was able to get their clock set correctly over the weekend. Um, call to order our meeting of regular meeting of council Monday, March the 10th at 7 p.m. Um, I do have to just ask council's indulgence, please, to see if you would be agreeable to switch the order on our um, agenda that would have us move the one item out of TPI to be our first item of new business, followed then by finance and admin items. Aside from that, there's uh, no other changes on here other than to let you know you're going to be entertained with a little uh, video at, in the mayor's message as well this evening. So with that, can I have approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Public participation. This is the time for the folks in the audience who can step to the, the uh, podium. Um, or right, did you do with the microphone, Marcy? There we go. Uh, if you have anything, message to council, something that you wanted to say, this would be the time. Hi, my name is Bob Ray. Purcell. I live at 2997 Charlotte Drive. I've applied for a bylaw for a secondary suite, I mean a permit, and I've, uh, VHA, I'm still in the process of doing the septic field. I have it started uh, by the end of this month. It'll be finished, and then I'll have the approval from VHA. I'd like to proceed with the permit at this. Apparently, I'm in violation of bylaw 977 that I've started the suite without a proper permit. I paid the extra fees that were due. There's a couple of items I'm not sure about. I've complied with everything else, but uh, the smoke detector in the furnace unit, I don't see reason why I should have to install that. Is that under a new law or it's an existing furnace? I don't understand why it would, I could see this more or less in a commercial application or in your building like this size, but for a secondary suite to install a smoke detector in the furnace system. It's not usually a conversation okay. um, uh, along there. Those are matters of staff and certainly I would make that call in and, and raise the question. Staff are, are available and probably taking notes. Okay. So um, if yeah, there's anything else. That, yeah, just to have this removed, that you're going to put notice on my title saying that I'm not okay. compliant. So I just say that I want to, my field is going to be done by the end of this month. So. Okay. Thank you. Just to clarify, in a situation like the notice on title that we're talking about for tonight, um, he does have the opportunity to speak when the item does come up on the agenda. Okay. So uh, I know we, we don't normally better, do that, but yeah. in this case, he would have the opportunity to speak on the item then. Okay. So don't leave after our movie. <laughs> um, any other members of the public? And for a third and final time, any other members of the public in public participation? All right. It's already been done. Um, I'll move forward then. Item number three, Mayor's message. I've got a couple of announcements here, and I'm sorry. One of them I'm not quite um, up to speed on here, but apparently the post office, Depot 4, on Goldstream Avenue is uh, putting on a fundraiser for the... 11 year old daughter whose mother was killed on Goldstream Avenue. It's upcoming. We will get the information and that will get posted to our website. So if there's anyone that wants to follow up on that, they can. Um, the other one that I have here is our Colwood Women's Institute is having their annual garage sale and muffin break fundraiser Saturday, March the 15th from 9 a.m. to 1.30 at the Colwood Community Hall. They're also looking for donations of saleable items that, um, that you can drop off to them. There is information, and again, that is on our website, uh, but I will caution you, no electrical items. They are prohibited on resaling 
um, of any, any uh, electrical items. The other one is a letter of, of um, recognition and thanks coming from National Defense for, it says, uh, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the support the City of Colwood and Colwood Fire Department provided to the Department of National Defense when responding to the incident at Belmont Park Monday the 24th of February. The quick response by the Colwood Fire Department ensured the safety of the family living in the home and minimized the damage to D&D property. This is the second incident in the past year where Colwood Fire Department has provided support to the residents in the Belmont Park community is a representation of the extraordinary connection between our communities. Thank you and your team for the support to our community. Captain Kasivi of Base Commander of D&D. Um, and so again, kudos to our, our fire department that were circulated earlier on that event. I think they had a motor vehicle accident first and then they had the fire just simultaneously almost. So um, well responded to. Uh, with that, I don't have anything else at this moment. Um, Marcy, are we, who needs to roll this or do the intro on it? <laughs> this is the result. Um, council encourages our staff to take advantage of training and, and the opportunity that is out there for them to expand their knowledge and skill sets for working for the city. And Marcy has been uh, involved in a program here. How long has it been going on, Marcy? Uh, this one's three months. Yeah, so this is her, her uh, resulting project with her team through LMGA. And uh, we're getting, it was shown on Saturday for her grade and, and mark, which we're anxiously awaiting to hear. And uh, this is the public presentation. You walk into this room at your own risk because it leads to the future. Not a future that necessarily will be, but a future that might be. This is not a new world. It is simply an extension of the last one. It has patterned itself after every person that has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of its history since the beginning. It will have refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the last one. But like every one of the councils that preceded it, it has one truth. Any counselor's ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of its citizens will become obsolete. A case to be filed L for learning in the municipal zone. So you have been elected to council. What were you thinking? I'm Rick Sterling. You may know me from other local government films, such as don't hate the ratepayer, hate the game. And voting isn't just for old people. In the municipal zone, we will help you with your transition to council by covering the following topics. Council meeting proceedings, conflict of interest, and council staff relations. Look, this is the fifth time I've been here requesting that something be done about the excessive speed on my residential street. Numerous animals have already been killed, and I'm just worried about I wish I had a nail file. Just worry that a child is going to be the next to die. Yes! Sorry, they scored. Let's take a look at council meeting proceedings in the municipal zone.
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I've received thousands of emails concerned about this public urination problem that we've got happening here in the city. I see that we've got no options other than to move forward and have $150,000 spent so that we can address this problem. So I would like to move that the city fund this $150,000 through taxation and purchase and install two urinals in the downtown core. I'll second that motion. On the main motion, all those in favor? It's unanimous, carried. Through the chair, I would like to move a motion that the city fund $500 for beautification for putting in native planting and flowers around the outside of these urinals. $500 for planting? I can't support a motion like that. What do you have against petunias in our community? Yeah, the green agenda. Right. And this is why the so union agenda will fail here in BC. Yeah. And yeah. 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 on the table that $250 be put toward native plantings and beautification around the new downtown urinal I second the motion on the main motion all those in favor opposed Take a look at conflict of interest in the municipal zone. Thank you, Your Worship. As Council knows from talking to me earlier, this is going to be a fantastic opportunity for the city. We'll be able to take that useless piece of farmland and turn it into a beautiful shopping center with tons of free parking. We might even be able to get an IKEA. <laughs> I'd like to put a motion on the table that the rezoning application be approved as presented. I second the motion. Is there any member of the uh, public wanting to speak to the application? Seeing none, uh, all members put up their hands in favor. Municipal solicitor gives us insight on the conflict of interest in the municipal zone. The first thing is for elected officials to be educated about um, what conflict of interest is so that they are alive to the possibility of a conflict arising and then being vigilant about circumstances that might trigger a conflict on their part. If they have questions, they can always consult with their colleagues or with senior, senior municipal staff. And then if there appears to be a, a real issue, uh, they can obtain legal advice. If they discover that they might have a conflict of interest before they're actually into the council meeting or the board meeting, they can uh, try and discuss this with colleagues or with senior municipal staff to get a better idea. If they find themselves in a situation in a council meeting where something comes up and they have a strong suspicion that they're in a conflict of interest or even if it appears to them that there is a reasonable possibility that they've got a conflict, um, that then they uh, would make a declaration that they are in a conflict of interest um, and they are to remove themselves from the meeting and uh, not participate in the discussion or the voting and not attempt to influence anyone else's decision making with respect to the matter. The next item on the evening agenda is a rezoning application for a large shopping center on Land Reserve Road. The applicant, Councillor, I mean uh, Mr. Borden, is here to speak to the application. Your Worship, as I am one of the developers involved in this application, I'd like to declare a conflict of interest and leave the chamber at this time. Well, that
that depends on the nature of the conflict of interest. There are two kinds of conflicts, and they have different consequences. If it's a non-pecuniary conflict of interest, so if the council member's financial interests are not affected, then there is no uh, legal consequence for a determination that the elected official was in a conflict of interest for the council member himself or herself. The consequence is that their vote would be nullified. However, if they participate in, a, in the discussion or vote on an issue in which there is a pecuniary conflict of interest, so it does affect their financial interests, the consequences can be disqualification from elected office until the next election, unless it's determined that the um, participation improperly at the meeting was as a result of inadvertence or an error of judgment in good faith. <laughs> a mechanism available under the Act. Uh, if a council member trying to do the right thing makes a declaration when it really isn't warranted, then under Section 100 sub 4 of the Community Charter, there's a process available whereby the elected official can obtain a legal opinion um, to the effect that there is no disqualifying conflict of interest, and then the elected official can uh, withdraw the earlier uh, declaration of a conflict and resume participation in council meetings respecting that matter. Let's take a look at council staff relations in the municipal zone. Sorry that I um, snapped at you like that. There's no call for that. I appreciate that you do donuts and coffee, and you're always really good at telling me um, what a good job I'm doing, and I really appreciate that. I'm sorry. Please accept my apology. Me as well. I'm sorry for getting in your space like that. I should have known before we, I came in. We've had a hard day. We have, haven't we? <laughs> Chief Administrative Officer, now Member of Council. Let's watch as he gives us insight on the effect of Council staff relations in the Municipal Zone. Well, I think that uh, it takes work, but I think that uh, hopefully both parties are willing. And uh, as a, a Councillor, I think it's incumbent for you to take the first step. Uh, especially if you're a new counselor. I think, you know, getting to know your staff, they're your senior advisors, they're your go-to people, they're, uh, you know, leading your organization. And I think that, uh, you know, making an effort to get to know them as professionals, uh, being open and forthcoming, that I think effectively as a, an elected representative, um, you're just going to be missing out on key points of information, key professional perspectives, um, that you're going to need to make an informed decision on either a policy or an issue about what you hope to accomplish uh, during that three-year term. Lay out a plan. You know, what are we going to get done in year one or, or 
are some of them more longer term, is it three year and beyond, and we can just set things in motion. Do we have our priorities straight uh, in terms of do we have consensus what we want senior staff to work on and where our resources are going towards? I think is going to give you a satisfaction because at the end of the day, uh, when you look back after spending three years at the council table, um, you're going to be able to say, yeah, we thought this went through. We thought these were our priorities. We assigned resources towards those. Um, and guess what? Year three, we knocked off four of the five. And that's a great sense of accomplishment. And you move the community forward. What staff is supposed to be doing and what uh, we, we as council members are, are supposed to be doing. You know, we don't, we don't uh, guide the organization. We set out, we do policy. We set broad direction. We find resources for staff. And then staff will get it done for us. Um, if it's clear and understood and it's realistic. So, you know, I've, I've always felt that, uh, that that is a great relationship and a good use of um, political resources as well as, as staff resources. In the municipal zone, all members of council have the statutory responsibility to consider the well-being and interests of the community, to contribute to the development and the evaluation of the policies and programs respecting municipality services and activities and to participate in council meetings. You are the voice in your community in the municipal zone. Yeah, there's just a, a little snip. <laughs> are the most important people in the municipal zone. <laughs> Thanks, well, Marcy. I understand that this is being presented to L LMGA and uh, leadership academy. Yeah. Yeah. So it may end up in a new counselor's training session in the very near future. That's great. What is All righty. Um, next item is one that gives me, um, are we going to do, okay, yeah, we'll do it that way. Uh, next item is our presentations and delegations, um, and it gives me great pleasure to have Councillor Judith Cullington um, make the presentation on this one in regards to the Rotary Award recipient sitting with us, Cindy Moyer. Let me do a little bit of, of introduction to this one. And Marcy, that's an awfully hard act to follow. <laughs> so, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't be anything quite, as, uh, quite like that. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Victoria Leadership Awards have been around for about um, 10 years. Um, they're hosted and led by Leadership Victoria in partnership with the University of Victoria and the Harborside Rotary Club. Um, those three organizations have worked together to develop what's become quite a successful uh, model of collaborative community leadership celebration. So they, they have a celebration every year, um, and boy, do they have a really strong um, candidate group. Um, I was very fortunate I got to go this year to the Leadership Award dinners, and, and there are a lot of really impressive people there. Um, they had their 10th anniversary this year, so there was a bit of a, a kind of a, a celebration. Um, and they said that since 2005, we've honored 58 individual leaders, including nine exemplary Lifetime Achievement Award recipients and five outstanding organizations. One of the greatest values of celebrating leadership is that it creates an inspirational ripple in the pond effect. Leading by example inspires others to take up positions of community leadership. We're proud to have recognized and celebrated those leaders during the first incredible decade of the Victoria Leadership Awards. So they have a, a whole series of, of different awards. There's a, a youth award and a, a lifetime award and a you know, University of Victoria one and Royal Roads University Leadership Excellence. One of the award categories they have is the Rotary uh, Community Leadership Award, which recognizes community leaders who meet the Rotary test of the highest levels of ethical behavior and community leadership benefit. 
There were two award winners this year. Um, one of them, um, the MC introduced by saying he will not be undersold. Um, Gordy Dodd, of course. Um, the other one, they introduced by saying, this person is the executive director of the Coast Collective Arts Center, an enterprising cultural nonprofit where she combines her 30 years of experience on the business side of the arts, education, and sustainable living with her passion for community leadership. She has a reputation for building win-win relationships in her professional life and through her work over the years with a wide variety of not-for-profit organizations. Cindy is currently president of the West Shore Arts Council, a community organization embarked upon a quest to see a performing arts center built on the growing West Shore. Cindy Moyer, recipient of the 2014 Rotary Community Leadership Award. Madam Mayor, would you like to help me? Yes, let's do this. Maybe all council want to help. And I have to say that Cindy continues to champion Colwood in all things possible, so thank you. Um, item 4.2, we have with us this evening three members of the, our uh, school district 62. Um, we are graced with the presence of our up and coming brand new um, uh, principal for the Royal Bay High School, as well as the vice principal and the chair of the Board of Trustees, Wendy Hobbs. So Wendy, and Mike Huck, and Wendy Beadle. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry, but I can't upstage everyone tonight because of the school. So um, I would like to introduce two of our outstanding staff members. We have Wendy, the principal, or as I say, the grand poobah. And that they told me I was a grand poobah, but, but I said no. And then we have Mike, and he's just the man. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we women have to stay. No, they're both wonderful, wonderful, top-notch staff members, and they just wanted to come and let you know that we're coming into your community, and we're coming on time. For all that rumor, it's on time, and if you ever have any questions, Carol can email me, and we can save you all a lot of email. So, yes, yeah, so we're on time. Both schools are on time. So I'd like Wendy to come and describe what's going on. And thanks for having us. Thank you very much for having us here today. Um, Mike and I thought it might be a good idea. I've met uh, Mayor Hamilton many times in the same committee. We were actually part of uh, the naming of Royal Bay, which ended up being Royal Bay. <laughs> so I thought it'd be a good idea for us just to come here and be familiar faces. And I appreciate Wendy coming along with us and missing her evening activities. I'm sure she'll have enough of them this week anyways. But Mike and I just want to spend a few minutes talking about Royal Bay, which is what we're very good at because right now Mike and I are the only Royal Bay people around. So I'll let Mike start off first. Well, good evening. Thanks for having us. Um, just want to reassure everybody that the, the buildings are on target to be opening up in September uh, 15. Um, hopefully you've uh, been able to drive by the site and see the, uh, the building rising up out of the ground and you'll see that uh, um, we'll have this building, uh, um, the shell, the other shall complete with the next two months, um, and from then, working on the insides and, and seeing what uh, what, what, what the uh, what the uh, the classrooms are going to look like. Um, so I'm I'm particularly excited about the building myself. Uh, um, you know, 
being on the ground looking at the, how the classes are being built and what's being put into school. Um, it's going to be a really exciting time in our community. We're having two brand new schools, and one in Langford and one in Colwood, um, that are, uh, have been needed for a long time. Um, and the, uh, the, the opportunities that present, they're going to be presented to our students or our kids are um, going to be phenomenal. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to be on board and, and see it uh, start. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully, if you haven't seen the building, you can go onto the SD62 website and see the architectural fly-through. Um, and what you'll see there is a, is a beautiful school um, that they're touting as one of the most technologically advanced schools in Western Canada um, when it's completed in, uh, um, in, a, in 18 months, ready for the uh, September start. Um, we've uh, completed our 95% uh, uh, plans and they're being reviewed, but uh, everything's on track for that. Uh, some of the stuff that, uh, um, th that that's kind of exciting for a guy who likes sports and rugby, that uh, we're going to have a beautiful fields up there, some basketball courts, and uh, pretty excited to uh, um, put some, uh, um, some good sports teams out. Um, the building itself is, uh, is very compact in design, so it'll uh, minimize exterior skin and energy loss will be minimal. So it'll be a, you know, an environmentally friendly school in, in our community. Um, and there is a non-combustible uh, uh, sprinkler building, so it will be uh, top notch in terms of safety for the kids and, and staff. So I'm very excited to be part of it and hopefully uh, um, the community will benefit from it, which I think they will. I'll keep your notes since I wrote them. <laughs> So uh, just a little bit about the school itself. As Mike said, um, it's a structured steel building, so it, it's made a little bit differently than some other. So they manufacture the steel off site and then bring it in and then put it up. So you'll see it coming up pretty quick in the next few months. Um, also, um, you know, we, Mike and I have been doing a little bit of work on going through all the middle and secondary schools in all of the Sukso and Milnes Landing and Belmont um, to talk about what the school is about, introduce ourselves, because we are a brand new school, we don't have a history, uh, you know, like some schools are being rebuilt. So that's pretty exciting for us. Uh, I actually asked uh, for a call up for PAC members and we had about 18 parents reply that they'd be really excited to be on the Royal Bay PAC <coughs> already. So we're going to um, look into having a meeting after spring break soon. Uh, we also are going to be going to Dunsford Middle School, which is our feeder school, and also to our grade 10s at Belmont to talk about a mascot. So we're going to start getting moving on a little bit of what we call the Royal Bay Wave and start talking about what is the mascot going to be and uh, go through sort of the process like uh, Mayor Hamilton and I did with the naming of the school, but make it more of a student level so we can get their excitement uh, also into this process. Uh, academic programs, they'll be similar to Belmont as Belmont is now. They have some great programs, so we will be duplicating those programs. We'll have uh, advanced placement programs. Academies, like Mike said, will probably be looking at things like soccer, uh, maybe lacrosse, and these are just proposed academies. We have to go through a process to get there. Um, equine studies has been brought up, which sounds really exciting. Same with golf, which is right down the road. So we'll have to look into you know, those kind of studies. There's also some academic academies. We've been looking at some, um, I think it was STEM uh, courses and um, some marine biology because we've got the opportunities with the ocean right there. A 350 seat theater, which is going to be really cool, plus a teaching kitchen, which is what we're looking forward to because we'll have really nice lunches every day. And uh, with Belmont, we'll look at similar timetables so that students in this you know, in the Western communities can take advantage of both the schools with some kind of, uh, you know, if they have, um, they want to take the teaching uh, culinary arts program, but they live close to Belmont, they, they've got some opportunity to switch in between schools. So uh, Ray Miller, the principal of Belmont, and Mike and I are working very closely and setting up timetables that'll work for our students. So thank you very much for having us here tonight. That's great. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, and keep in mind the woolly mammoth story of yeah. that site. <laughs> the mammoth uh, apparently, I heard just recently that there is an archaeological group coming in to do some work in there um, uh, in an undisclosed location at this point, but um, all in, in concert with the uh, finding of those that bone structure in there from some time ago. So it's a, it's a breaking story. Um, anything from council? Comments, questions? Uh, Judith, I think. No, I, I was just. Oh, just okay. Kidding. Councilor Martin. I um, actually, would you guys mind just stepping back up? I just have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, I have questions for all of you. So, if Wendy, Wendy's there too. So. This this is okay. Councilor Martin. Yeah. 
I, Maybe this was a test. I, I make up one once in a while. For, I, I'm dealing with a lot of rumors, obviously. So the very first one is great. I'm really happy to hear that the building's on time. Um, and um, it's nice to sort of snub that out, that, that the, the Royal Bay was. I think the, the reason that happened is because unlike Belmont, where it's being built on site, mm -hmm. Royal Bay is being built away and being brought the steel. And you'll see the walls go out lickety split. They're absolutely right. on, on time for the opening in 2015. Yeah, the different which, building process. which is fantastic. I mean, yeah. where where the where the rumor originated from was uh, from Langford councillors on West Shore Park and Rec. They they had actually said it in a public forum. Um, the 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 first question I have is a uh, rumor wise is I know John Stubbs is a feeder for the new Belmont, but when we were at the economic, the question was where is which school is going to be the French immersion school or where would the French immersion students be going? From John Stubbs, do we have has there been Belmont. a well? It, for sure, it would be Belmont. Well, okay, that's so. all. That's all just happening right now. We're just going into a consultation with that. Um, as right now, the forms that I've received that the board hasn't really passed yet, it's Belmont. So we're you've probably all heard about that. You know the John Stubbs kids, and basically what we're trying to get out there though, it's not just 140 kids in John Stubbs. We're moving 3,600 kids. Because what people have to remember is for the last 10 years, we've talked about great configuration and catchment areas. Because we can't have all the kids coming into Royal Bay. That's not going to work. So we've talked all along, you know, people don't want to come out to meetings. You guys know what it's like. And then all of a sudden, decisions start to be made. And then people start to come. So we're just starting with how it's all happening. built out to 1,200 eventually, and Belmont has the capacity of 1,200 to start with, so that was all taken into consideration. Uh, otherwise, if, if we didn't divide you know, uh, mm -hmm. the way we had, we'd end up with uh, probably portable education. <laughs> yeah. which, which leads to my second question, which you guys have kind of semi-addressed, was uh, percentages of students geographically what, what are we anticipating? Are we anticipating that Langford kids will be going to Royal Bay and vice versa, Colwood kids will be going to? Or are we, are we you're talking about catchment areas. Have, have you guys done any thought process in That's that? That's exactly what staff is doing. Working on right yeah. now. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, because one of, my, one of my biggest concerns with the two schools is, is that I definitely don't want them to be competing with each other. Like there's that negative, con there's always healthy competition, but there can be negative competition as well. So. I think you get away from that if you don't have them in geographically in the same. Yeah. They just want to go to school. Yeah. The final question I have for you is just in, and Wendy, this is more for you, is can, uh, as you're probably aware, Colwood uh, stepped up and contributed an additional uh, dollars to help fund the second field at uh, Royal Bay. And can I get some clarification because I've heard different things through Council, and I've also heard different things through senior staff uh, at the school district on exactly uh, what Langford has done regarding uh, their contributions to two fields at Belmont High School, the new Belmont High School. Wow, I didn't think I was going to come into a political <laughs> arena here. Um, well, basically, they've we've gone into partnership with the Gaudi field, and originally there was some money that was put into parking and stuff. So I'm not quite sure what what you want. Oh no, I just I just would like to clarify. I mean, the the budget for for the field has not been approved yet at, right. from Langford right. or for West Shore Park and Rec. For the I don't know field. the exact numbers. So, so no, no, and I, I just yeah. uh, they're they they basically have been quoted as saying that uh, uh, that they paid for two fields and they don't wish to contribute anything more um, to a field at, at Royal Bay. So I just wanted to. Con confirm if that was true or not true. And so I think, I think our secretary treasurer emailed you back that answer today, correct? I got a voicemail from him. Because I've got it, it in my email if it, you want me to no, read it No, I didn't get an out email from him. Okay, well, why don't I read it out exactly what he said to you, That'd and then awesome. you'll have the answer. We apologize, Wendy, for bringing you into this meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a joint use agreement for the Gowdy Field that, that we pay compensation for and that Langford helped in the acquisition cost of additional land required at the Glen Lake site. So that's your answer. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. I'm done. At this point, I bid to stay out of the political arena. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, folks. Um, we are going to be entering into sort of the main part of the business, so I will give those guests who might have other pressing things to do this evening, uh, like dinner and stuff, um, get on their way <laughs> to flee, as Councillor Logan says. Thanks very much for coming. Cindy, thank you again, and congratulations. Thanks, Steve. Okay, moving in then to adoption of our regular meeting of Council February 24th minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Looking to receive a series of minutes, uh, Cycling Advisory Committee minutes of February 3rd, Planning and Land Use Committee minutes of February 18th, Heritage Commission and St. John the Baptist Church Management Committee, uh, January 15th, and Transportation and Public Infrastructure, February 3rd. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. We have a couple of um, three items here in regards to correspondence requiring council direction. Um, first is a letter from Mayor Wayne Wright, City of New Westminster, in regards to the recent amendments to the Canada Post system. The letter was included in our packages, um, and they are asking for support in um, in um, writing um, to the federal government uh, to deal with the issue of the residential door-to-door -door postal delivery changes. Um, is it? Do we need to make our own resolution or just whether or not we're supporting the resolution that's here? It's up to council to determine if they want to support the request from New Westminster to okay. pass a similar resolution or of course a resolution of your own or just to receive yeah. the information. So there is a number of whereases and, and uh, further be resolved um, at the end it is as noted above, the City of New Westminster requests that the federal government direct Canada Post to maintain the current system of residential door-to-door -door postal delivery in Canada. We look forward to your action on this matter. What is Council's direction? Councillor Dave? Thanks. So I'd like to see our Council support the resolution. I think they've, they've crafted a good resolution in support of door-to-door -door delivery, which um, I realize it is a complicated issue, but uh, my husband did work his entire career for Canada Post, and I can tell you that there are a number of people in our community who benefit from door-to-door -door delivery, and in fact, um, they are even still the go-to people, even if you hire a different delivery company quite often, that is processed through Canada Post as well. Um, so th there's a huge level of service within our community and there's also an employer that is within our community. Many people who live in our community work um, through, through them and uh, I think it's important to support uh, um, an industry uh, within our community. Uh, there's huge amounts of uh, land and assets that have been uh, used to uh, maintain it as a Crown Corporation for years and uh, certainly there are some uh, uh, scary implications uh, of pulling back um, to uh, maintaining it uh, what started as a service uh, available to citizens being maintained uh, simply as whatever is profitable. Other members of council? I will read out the one section here and whereas this proposed change would entail the downloading of responsibilities costs and liabilities to local governments, including requirements for municipal land and rights of way, infrastructure such as paving and lighting, and policing related to vandalism, graffiti, and mail theft is one of their key highlights in there. Um, anyone else? Seeing none, call yes before I go there. Thank you. Through the chair to the director of finance, maybe, I'm not sure it should be the CAO, but do we have any idea what these costs are going to be for our residents or for uh, us as council? I don't know what the order of magnitude is. No idea. Okay. Councillor Dave? 
Well, I can only speak to a very small part of what the order of magnitude of costs are, but uh, in maintaining uh, super boxes, for example, there's been huge costs involved with uh, having to continuously replace them due to vandalism. There's been mail theft. There's been identity theft associated with super mailboxes and the problems associated with, with them. Um, and we do have a significant amount of Colwood who, who is receiving door-to-door -door service. Uh, one of those super bucks that was stolen out of Saanich was found just down Wishart, laying in the ditch there. Um, about a month and a half ago, so empty, of course. Um, so we do need a motion brought forward here in some capacity as to what to do with this. Um, Councillor Day, were you looking to make that motion? Sure, I'm trying to think of how to, how to word it. Um, I would uh, move that the City of Cobwood support uh, the resolution uh, from the City of New Westminster and uh, send a letter to the federal government and uh, FCM of support. Seconder? Second. Any further conversation, discussion? Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item number 6.2, again, a letter, this time from Shane Campbell, President and Executive Director, Settlers Rail and Trails, request for a City of Colwood flag for Argyle Museum and the Canadian flag collection. Uh, again, I need direction on this. We do have a flag that is available for us to send uh, through to this museum. We, I think there was a link to um, the Canadian flag collection, and what they're trying to do is collect an, um, a municipal flag from all available municipalities across the country. Madam Mayor, I would move that we supply a flag to the uh, Settlers, Rails and Trails Argyle Museum. Second. Conversation, discussion? Councilor Martin? Um, just real quick, is, uh, has any staff member or has anybody actually looked into the legitimacy of this? Like, is this an actual real museum with yeah. real flags? Who goes to a flag museum? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> like, is it seriously, this is, this it's in Argyle, Manitoba. Legitimate? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll have, have you know that my uh, father's uh, military uh, and my grandfather's military um, uniforms are in a museum in Manitoba as well. So there's many small museums in Manitoba. Councillor Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious as to, since we are going through a rebranding of our uh, city's uh, logo, et cetera, uh, as to whether or not we're going to update our flag and which flag we're going to be sending. I'd kind of like to, for them to have our first one and maybe we can add a second at a time down the road. Anyone else? Call the question, all those in favor. Did you have something to add to it though, Pat, just on legitimacy? Because we did do that. I did do some research, yeah. and it is a museum that does have a Canadian flag section within the museum. Um, but I did want to just mention, uh, in addition to uh, hoping that the city would provide them with a flag, and um, they are aware that we are going through a rebranding and our flag is going to change, but we do have the current flags in stock. Um, they, the policy allows us to either gift or lend for a certain period of time. It also allows us to allow people to purchase. Uh, they all have to sign the etiquette uh, protocol policy. Uh, I just need to know from council if you're willing to gift it or uh, allow them to have it uh, free of charge or for charge. I think their intention is to try to obtain it for no charge, uh, but that's part of the dis dis decision that council has to make as well. And with respect to the new flags, we're just we're not quite there yet with the actual look and design of the new flags, so we are still going to work with our current Colwood flag for a period of time still. So add to your motion around the... I was thing. considering at no cost because we did already have the flag here. Okay. And a seconder on that? We have? You got a seconder on that one? Okay. Um, any further questions, comments? Call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. 
There you go. Well, you got happy answers. Mm-hmm. Um, item 6.3, mem memorandum from Chief Administrative Officer, letter from the Capital Regional District Board, uh, requesting an amendment to the West Shore Parks and Rec Society Constitution. I just want to bring to uh, Council's attention that this uh, letter that is uh, addressed to uh, Councillor Rob Martin um, was predominantly put into this report because there was another letter forthcoming directing uh, to Council itself. Um, many of the other municipalities uh, were not participating uh, in council deliberations this week, so I chose to uh, provide this exact duplicate other than the, the title to, to which it was addressed to. Uh, this speaks to an issue of a pecuniary uh, uh, conflict of interest. Uh, the BC Court of Appeal uh, last January 2013 found that two uh, uh, Salt Spring Island trustees were found in conflict of interest due to their roles on a non-for-profit uh, um, not organization. And as a result, the CRD ha has talked to uh, the director uh, that sits on the West Shore Park and Rec Society uh, to resign his position. Furthermore, uh, asking that uh, the bylaws that create uh, the opportunity for membership on that society board um, to uh, be amended uh, to allow for a community member to be a representative for that electoral area. Uh, furthermore, as part of their recommendation, um, I'm, I'm suggesting that the, the West Shore Parks Rec uh, Society be requested to amend their constitution to require that all members of the society board be non-elected officials, just to take away that uh, pecuniary conflict of interest or even the, the perception of conflict of interest. I think we can perhaps recommend that, but the whole board of governance thing is in question right now anyway, so I wouldn't want to impede the opportunity for this section and contributor to the West Shore Parks and Rec be hampered or hindered in participating any further. He has not been at the board table for some time um, because of this whole, uh, where are we, just about a year, I guess, um, there, which, you know, I mean, although they're, a, although they're a large area with a small contribution, um, he is a, a one-person entity, so there is no alternate, there is no, no offside, you know, person here at the table. We have two members of our council who sit at West Shore Parks and Rec, and when it comes down to those budgetary decision-making processes, both excuse themselves from this <coughs> table in order to, um, you know, remain uncompromised in making that decision. For Mike, there's no ability for him to do that. So uh, this has been addressed at the CRD board, and then the CRD board has uh, supported it moving in that direction, and so this is kind of the, the follow through. So I imagine all councils that are participatory members of West Shore Park and Rec will be seeing this in the next short while. So. Councillor Logan. Thank you, Worship. Well, this is certainly an unfortunate um, consequence of that ruling, and it's uh, uh, the CRD's tact is similar to um, what they've taken on Crest as well. So uh, what they've said is that there are three regional directors who are shareholders uh, uh, are no longer permitted to serve as directors on Crest, and uh, Director Hicks had uh, stepped down about six months ago as a result, and the uh, the uh, two remaining have since stepped down for those very reasons. So they're, I believe they're looking for, uh, although the, the three directors still hold the share uh, of Crest uh, for the CRD, um, they're looking at uh, non-elected representation on, on the board. Um, and it really calls into question, you know, some of, um, uh, some of the ramifications on municipal, municipal um, representatives on the board and I see Pat kind of giving me the no okay if I may through the mayor um, it, it raises that issue um, whether or not uh, members of that society board being elected officials with the city council here need to be a part of this discussion or should we be asking them to leave the room which further complicates the whole governance issue about the West Shore Parks and Rec Society and I believe by taking politics out of the day-to-day -day operations uh, there may be further benefits on that productive relationship moving forward. 
but what I am asking is for council minus uh, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Martin and Day um, to participate in that discussion uh, and vote and to support the, the motion by CRD uh, to make that amendment to allow for that electoral um, district of the CRD uh, to be replaced by uh, a non-elected official such as the community and, and if council so chooses to further um, make the amendment that all participating members sit on um, that sit on the society board be community members we are a little bit different from our, our members that are just adjacent to us uh, city of Langford I believe have four elected officials on that board so that would leave a bigger question for them as to the conflict of interest and not having established quorum at council but so the the question I do have is for Councillor Day and to Councillor Martin whether or not we need to declare a conflict and be a part of this discussion or, or leave. Yeah, probably we should uh, no, leave uh, this discussion. No money involved. It really has. To, it really oh. falls to the the um, yeah, matter of money. Yeah, we're not having a discussion around money. It's not about budget. It's not about mm -hmm. anything that's of value. It's about a governance and policy thing but Pat do you have alternate information I think it's a really difficult decision because my understanding is by being a director of the West Shore Parks and Recreation Board your obligation is to the board before it's to council which means even the information that you have or talk about or share at the board level is not information that you're able to come back with and even share with your council so that is what leads to some of our other complications when it comes to budget issues because now they bring their budget forward that needs council approval and two of you have to leave the room. Hopefully we still have quorum in order to keep that going. So my understanding is to err on the side of caution, uh, the board members should be uh, protecting their own interests by any time there's anything that's coming up that is to do with the West Shore Parks and Recreation Board at the council table you shouldn't participate or vote on the issue and if you can't participate and you can't vote you shouldn't be in the room for the discussion I'm leaving <laughs> <laughs> with so that just uh, bit before I'm Councillor sorry. Martin these I just had a question because what I heard um, was that as as members of the board that um, our duty is to the board um, but we were elected to council so how is it that the board somehow my appointment to the board supersedes my duty to council it's not to do with the board it's to do with this um well the society act has a role and the fact that this new case law that's been put into place since this uh how do you say it schlenker versus torgrimson lawsuit so in the background we have uh francesca marzari who is a solicitor with young anderson is actually working with the Union of British Columbia Municipalities as well as the provincial government to try to have regulation put into place that provides exemptions and exemptions would apply in situations like ours where we have a nonprofit society that is actually intended it, it's an extension of the local government bodies and so this rule shouldn't apply to us because it's not an outside agency of which you sit on their board we are the agency and it's our board so how long that regulation will take to get into place though is the difficulty in the meantime her recommendation is to uh, protect your interests okay then I'm so prepared that, to uh, declare a potential conflict and I am hurt. also declaring a potential conflict and I am leaving the chambers yeah you'll just get outside the door there I saw a video it's quite cute yeah <laughs> <laughs> he passed if I may, Mayor, uh, I, I see the same value uh, in exclusion uh, for these sort of discussions when there's financial uh, matters to be uh, discussed. Um, this is a great issue. This is, uh, you know, it's very great. It's very new and fresh into uh, politics in BC, mm -hmm. and something that we're trying to find our way through. Um, yeah. uh, very difficult, uh, but I, I think moving forward, I think the suggested uh, uh, resolutions to be provided to the, the society board uh, would alleviate this issue uh, given the amount of time that it would take to change legislation mm -hmm. and I know you know there are communities within our province who have suffered 
um, through budget situations um, because of this, because of not having quorum at the table to be able to to go through. So they've had to um, remove themselves from the various boards, which sets up a whole other problem. In those small communities, sometimes you are multitasking. So um, can you, for the benefit of those of us who are left behind to make the decision, re read the um, motion that you have or resolution that you have there? Sure. The following resolution is offered for consideration. That the Municipal Council of the City of Colwood support the Capital Regions Regional Districts Board February 28, 2014 request to the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society to amend their constitution to allow for a citizen representative to be appointed as a director to represent this Juan de Fuca Elector area on the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society Board and that the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society be requested to amend their constitution to require that all members of the society board be non-elected officials. Move and shaker. I'll move it. Uh, no, Councillor oh, Collingsbury has a comment. I'm, or I'm, question. I'm comfortable with the first half, and the reason I'm uncomfortable with the second half is I know there's sort of discussions around how they're constituting themselves, and I just, I'm, I don't know the answer to is it timely, is it appropriate. Um, I'm feeling like they're kind of two different pieces. One is is a very simple piece, um, and so I would move the first half of the motion. Um, but I'd like to to do it in in two pieces because I'm I'm not yet comfortable with the second half. Would it have any comfort to you if in that section, because I have same kind of concerns on there, that the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society be requested to consider amending their constitution to require that all members of the society board be non-elected officials and it leaves it in the conversation and mm -hmm. it leaves it still at the table where it has to have that yeah. it's not a direction it's, it's, a it's certainly easy language i still i would still feel comfortable splitting it in two so that it doesn't become a, a one condition on two yeah. kind of thing okay the, yes the i'm happy so. i'm happy to do it so in in two parts so um i'll move part one so Councillor Collington will move part one. Uh, seconder, Councillor Second. Lukens. Any further conversation table-wise? No, call the question all those in favor. Opposed, motion carried. And then the second part, add in the word consider uh, in there to consider amending their constitution. Does that work? Or do you have something strong? No, I think, that, I think that. I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable with that. Okay, so the second one then would read that the West Shore Parks and Recreation Society be requested to consider amending their constitution to require that all members of the society board be non-elected officials. Do we need to add to avoid? Um, these board problems or just leave it in there and simple? I'm, I'm good with it the way it is. No, no, I'm no, pointing, she's pointing at you. At you. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you, through the chair to the CAO. I was just wondering if um, inserting the word consider there in, in that second part of the resolution actually um, weakens it considerably. We're only one of a number of partners. We can't demand that they make those changes, it has to be a collaborative. So at least we're putting it out there that it. If you don't mind, through the chair from the, to the CAO, do you know what other um, municipalities in the region are doing with respect to this? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Sullivan, uh, I'm not aware of what the other municipalities are currently doing. I know some of the, the smaller municipalities are going to be in a difficult situation in that they only have one uh, elected official that is appointed to the society board. I think there's a greater governance issue here at play, and I, I think we cannot forget the day-to-day -day operations of this valuable asset to our communities that I, I believe must be at forefront here. And I, I think in order to alleviate some of the, the political um, wranglings and you know uh, the sensitivities that arise at the operational table, if we remove those 
that are elected, uh, the community members at large um, will have a significant uh, opportunity to provide better value uh, for our, our taxpayers in the region and keep some of uh, the, the potential conflict and uh, other discussions around at the owner's table. Um, I would further suggest that maybe rather than have mayors sit around at the owner's table, that it be the CAOs that report to their respective councils. And it would align with uh, our, our governance model somewhat more than what this uh, society uh, board has set up uh, but that's only my opinion. But I believe that this is a first step for that transition. Councillor Logan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you uh, to the CAO. Uh, what about the accountability factor? You know, so you take the elected representation off uh, the board, and with it goes the accountability factor, so to speak. And that's one of the biggest complaints with the CRD, as an example. Well, uh, th there's accountability, but ultimately any sort of budget approvals, uh, new investments uh, for new capital um, must come back through the respective membership. The accountability lies in that process. Uh, you can uh, indicate a reporting structure uh, to your uh, appointed uh, community uh, uh, persons uh, that you know maybe every quarter you come back and report to council based on the activities and new services and programs that uh, the center is providing. Any further conversation, discussion? Call the question then on the second, or do we have mover and shaker on that one? I'll be, I'll be, a, I'll be a mover. Um, I just a second. We need a seconder then? I'll second. One second. Councillor Lukund. Uh, call the question then, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, do you wanna just grab the folks there? And actually we should. This is where we jump, folks, to transportation and public infrastructure. Uh, item 7.2.1 will become the top of our discussion. The secret. <laughs> Councillor Cullington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this item is regarding the um, project at Wishart and Candale. Um, and as you know, um, our staff have been working on all kinds of interesting things up there, including the, the realignment of Candale Road, um, installation of bike lanes and sidewalks, flashing pedestrian signal, the crosswalk, the landscape, the rain garden, the trees. Um, but the project did run over budget, which is why it's currently stalled. Um, so this, <coughs> excuse me, this report came to, to TPI to talk about what happened and why and look at some of the options moving forward. <clears throat> so there's actually a lot of good news out of this. So um, staff took the, the initiative to, to do quite a lot of this interesting things. So this was um, probably one of the first projects of its kind um, that was built by our public works staff. Um, and they took the opportunity to include a, a training exercise as a part of it. So for example, um, we now have some of our crews who can do the concrete curbs and sidewalks, which is something that they, they couldn't do before. Um, and it was also um, set out as a, a kind of a motivational piece. In other words, if we're getting our folks building these things, they also then take ownership of it um, and take, you know, they're more likely to kind of be very involved in, you know, pulling out a weed as they go past the rain garden or, or whatever. Um, and of course, in the long time, it's hopefully going to provide us with some efficiencies because we've got our crews trained up to, to do some of the work that needs to happen in various different locations um, around the, the city. We originally had um, a budget of about 97000 out of gas tax, um, but it did go over budget for um, a couple of reasons. One is that um, because of the training component, um, that went ahead, but it was then realized that we couldn't pay that out of the gas tax. Um, so that has to come from um, a different source. Um, there, is, there was also a lot of work, additional work, unforeseen work that happened on the project in terms of making sure the kids got to school safely. So we, we hired some temporary flag folks um, because, of course, it's a, you know, a route to school and, and the crews were working really hard to make sure that there was always a, a safe sidewalk um, going through. So, and there was also um, a bit of a, um, 
a perfect storm um, in terms of, of sort of people coming and going, a, a deputy engineer who was new into the position, our manager of public works who wasn't, uh, who's away on, on LTD at the moment, um, and a public works crew who's not, um, you know, wasn't experienced at, at kind of managing the budget side of this. So when I get to the to the recommendations, um, you will see that there's one of the recommendations looking at kind of making sure that, that this doesn't happen again. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I, I guess it's fair to say there was some concern expressed at committee that, you know, um, that this had happened, but at the same time also um, opinions expressed that, you know, if we're going to um, encourage our folks to, to take on new roles and, and encourage innovation and try some new things, then we will make mistakes from time to time, and so it's important not to get bogged down, but to kind of learn from it and, and go forward. Um, before I get into the kind of the go forward piece, Michael, did you want to? Yeah, I, I just wanted to apologize to council. Um, I should have seen that with uh, Dan off on LTD and the changes in engineering, there was a chance that the ball get dropped, and I should have uh, checked that. Um, the ball got dropped in two places, really. Uh, the first one is that um, the budget was wrong. Um, you know, the eventual price to build it is very similar to what we would expect the contractor to build it for. In fact, uh, um, we went, we priced everything here um, for the uh, um, in the um, revised b uh, budget proposal as if it was being built by a contractor, and that seems to be matching what Public Works is building it for. Uh, with the caveat that Public Works was doing a job on safety that I've never seen any contractor do and that we will be demanding on future jobs that kind of standard. Um, and, uh, and the other place that the ball got dropped is that we didn't pick up on the fact that the budget was wrong and we were heading over it early enough. And that's a, that's a lack of monitoring, and I apologize for that. So, we have from committee um, a series of recommendations, and I just wanted to sort of explain them before we kind of launch into moving them individually. So, the first one deals with um, the intersection itself and the works immediately around that. Um, so, we originally had, and hopefully this chart that I just um, got passed around will help us a little bit. So if you look at the intersection of Candale and Wishart, we originally had $97,000 approved out of the gas tax. Um, and the first recommendation looks, and, and our actual total cost will be in the order of uh, $128,000 to complete that. So that shortfall is proposed to come from two different sources. One is that 18,000 would come out of the, the training budget reserve, um, so that takes into account the work that was, that was um, related to training of our public works crews, um, and that the remaining 13,000, um, rather than asking for more gas tax, we would look at, at that coming out of um, probably um, the overlay budget or another part of the existing public works budget um, as, as appropriate. So that's what the, that first recommendation deals with. The second recommendation talks about the other piece of the project that we were hoping to complete at this time, and that's a sidewalk from Cairndale through to, to Ackland. So we had originally approved that, and we'd um, given it a, a budget of $30,000 out of gas tax. Staff came back to us and said that budget is actually significantly under. The real cost is much closer to $107,000. So if we want to complete that, um, we would have to find another $77,000 from somewhere. That could be gas tax. Um, there is a little bit of money in the sidewalk fund, $21,000. Um, but at, at, you know, at least some of it would have to, to come from gas tax. The other piece of the puzzle that committee looked at um, was um, in addition to what we had earlier talked about, but it would make the project very complete, and that is to complete the, the sidewalk between Ackland and Wishart School. So you'd then have sidewalk all the way along um, 
um, but the, we hadn't allowed anything previously in our budget, and we are looking at an additional $56,000 to do that work. So you can see that um, you know we went from a project of 127,000 to, if we were to add in the Ackland piece, to um, getting close to $300,000 for that. There is money in the gas tax, but obviously it would come um, out of other projects. And at this moment in time, um, the Kelly Soup Road project is the one that's that's got the flexibility around it. Um, and then the the final recommendation um, deals with um, making sure we're, we're we're doing this right going forward and not um, not running over budget. So I would like to to do this as a as a series of motions. And the first one, um, there is a, an error in there. Um, it says in here will result in a total spending of 110,000 from gas tax. That should, I believe, say $97,000 from gas tax. Okay, so it was recommended by committee and I so moved that the 2014 budget be modified to reassign 13,000 in public works and engineering budget to complete the pavings and plantings of the main intersection at Wishart and Candale with early budget approval, which will result in a total spending of $97,000 in gas tax on this project over two years, plus 18,000 paid out of the training budget reserves. Second. Discussion, Council? Councillor Lukens. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a question, if we're taking that money out of the um, training budget, what is that going to mean? What's the impact to the um, department? That's actually out of a reserve from last year's training budget. It's a, it won't impact this year's training budget. Okay, thank you. Councillor Day, sorry. Thanks, no problem. Um, for this $18,000 in training costs, um, we were saying that this, um, the, the budgets which weren't uh, correct to begin with but have now been um, upsized, shall we say, um, are approximately equal to the contract price uh, were we to go out to tender um, on these items. Um, but we're, we're spending money on training our staff to do this. So uh, I'm just wondering, will there be cost savings in the future over what it would cost us to go out to contract on this type of initiative? Because um, I'm just wondering whether we should continue with this type of projects in-house or if, you know, spending this $18,000, what is the value um, that we're getting from it if we're not? going to continue down this road of doing these types of projects in-house? In, in general, it's a good idea to um, let public works crews who j normally do nothing but maintenance do some construction um, because it uh, it's very motivational and it also involves them in the business of building things they've got to maintain. So there's a certain amount of pride that comes with that. but. How far you carry that depends on yeah whether we uh, whether we can prove to be um, uh, more economical than contractors or less. And uh, one of one of the um, uh, things that will be different this year is that the uh, spending on equipment will be better taken into account. Uh, which you know by the time we've taken all these uh, um, real costs into account, uh, we need to. Uh, either get slightly better at building these or, or council may decide that they want to do mo uh, the vast majority of it with contractors. And if I could just follow up on that, 18,000 seems like a lot of money for training. Um, can you just give us a bit of an idea how that is broken down? Um, I, don't, I don't have the breakdown, but I know that it involved having extra staff on site for uh, several whole days while they did various portions of the concrete sidewalk and the concrete curb. They, they currently do um, asphalt curbing. They're all, uh, you know, we have the skills on board to do that. But we hadn't uh, done any con concrete curbing. And of course, there's several phases to that. So they, they're on site for multiple days. 
And just one last um, small follow-up, and that was just in regards of the um, the budget, the um, uh, table that was handed out um, about uh, the intersection and the other options um, shows $97,000 from gas tax, $18,000 from training, and it also refers to another $13,000, um, which for a grand total of $128,000 for the intersection at Carindal and Wishart. And I'm just wondering what that $13,000 is for. That's oh, what it's, I guess that's, that's part of the overage cost, including the, the temporary flag folks. Well, the, the, um, the training is in the 18,000, the 13,000 non-training is uh, is basically what the budget was out by. Landscaping, paving, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> completion stuff. And and the and the intention in the, mm -hmm. yeah. and the intention in this motion is that that money come from existing public works budgets. So no implication to taxpayers, no implication to the gas tax. Okay, thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, I appreciate the city engineer and his apology. Uh, I, I, that means a lot. Uh, I'm being serious. I'm not being sarcastic or anything. Uh, the the uh, question I have, though, is everybody makes, you know, we always, I mean, overruns are overruns, and that's just the way things happen. I guess my question is, I didn't really understand what we're doing differently now that we've had this and we understand that we've had these issues and that. Moving forward, how, how are we anticipating that we're going to be changing our behaviors? Um, and there's a part of the series of resolutions that deals with that. But basically it amounts to having a system that everybody understands, not just a couple of guys at the top understand, um, that is a paper system instead of, uh, um, you know, the sort of seat of the pants way it was done in the past, which when we were smaller and doing a lot less um, you know, and you had the old guy in charge, whether it was on our side or the public works side, you know, it, it, we came in on budget repeatedly. Uh, I mean, we brought Well Road in on budget, it's a $3 million project. Um, and it was the fact that the staff changed and there was no paper system that they could be introduced to. I think that's basically where we failed to, to make the changeover. Lupins? Through yourself, uh, Your Worship, I'd like to just ask the Director of Finance that she's comfortable that we've got the checks and balances in place going forward uh, with respect to, you know, any projects that would be approved. And I know it's in here about, um, you know, assisting in the costing, et cetera, but that we've got the checks and balances in place going forward so that we're not incurring this. Um, type of overrun because I can tell you it was a surprise to me when I read this in the in the um, TPI report um, and I was really excited about this when we approved it and you know all those sorts of things I do understand accidents and overruns do happen um, it was just a little above what I anticipated <laughs> so I just want to know from finance that they have what they need in order to be able to support engineering and uh, the team moving forward Yes, I'm confident that we do going forward. Any further conversation? Uh, we have a series of recommendations there. Councillor Cullington, are you taking them one off at a time or? Okay, so we have the let's move in. So the first one has been moved and seconded. Yep. And you've got a new number on that 110. Yep. Uh, it now says 97. Yeah. So call the question on the first one. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried? Thank second you. One. So the, the second motion um, coming out of TPI um, relates to the, um, the sidewalk between Cairndale and Ackland. Um, as I mentioned, we had originally approved 30,000 under the gas tax. Um, it looks like the real cost is 107,000, so considerable difference. Um, so if we um, would like to see this piece um, completed, we will be looking for an additional $77,000 to fund that. 
21,000 of that could come from the sidewalk fund. Um, and there is a little bit of money in the overlay budget, um, or there is um, gas tax available. Uh, there was discussion at committee. Um, I think, you know, uh, notwithstanding the cost, I think a, a sense from committee that it's a project we'd started and, and we, were, we really would like to see sort of moving forward to, to completion, at least as far as, as Ackland. So it was recommended by committee, and I so move that the 2014 budget be modified to reassign an additional 77,000 in gas tax funding from the Kelly Souk Road project for a total budget of 107,000 for construction of a sidewalk from the existing Wishart Carindale project to Ackland Road with early budget approval. Seconder? Second. Discussion? Councillor Logan? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Although, um, I, I did oppose the recommendation coming from uh, out of committee, and I, I did voice my concerns at that time, and I'm not going to reiterate uh, what they were at this time. But uh, my my big concern was that um, again we're we're targeting a specific fund, the gas tax fund, and a specific project in an area that is in um, dire need of some help, and that's the Kelly Souk area and um, it's one of our goals you know to fix up that area and that that transportation network and we seem to rob that area all the time so that was my my um, reason for opposing it uh, but I do strongly support that connection as uh, it's a significant route to school and uh, and currently that section uh, between the end of our project and to Ackland uh, has doesn't even have an asphalt curb and that was one of the reasons why I had uh, pushed for it uh, in the initial um, project scope so uh, we did have some discussion about the sidewalk fund and uh, the CAO did have some language after that uh, we had voted on um, the motion that uh, could incorporate the sidewalk fund as uh, an alternative or as at least uh, a source of funding rather than targeting the gas tax fund right off the bat. Um, so before I, before I asked James, perhaps if he had some suggested wording, I, I did have some um, some questions or a question about the sidewalk fund to the director of finance, and she may not be able to be in a position to to answer it tonight. Um, but I understood that there was more than uh, twenty one thousand dollars in the sidewalk fund. Um, so I was curious as to. Um, what expenditures we've made out of that fund. Uh, I was under the impression we had you know, upwards of 200,000. Um, and some of the projects that were previously uh, approved for funding from gas tax were switched in the budget process to be funded from sidewalk instead. So I think the balance I calculate for uh, the deputy to the city engineer uh, was about $21,000 left after those budget decisions were made. Okay, thank you. Um, James, did you have some alternative uh, wording then to include this? Through the mayor to uh, Councillor Logan, uh, it was very simple. It was uh, the 2014 budget being modified to reassign an additional $77,000 in funding from the existing budget for a total of uh, 107. So it, it put it back in the onus of staff to find uh, alternative solutions from just the gas tax in funding for this specific project. Uh, so I would, uh, I'd be happy to make that, uh, move that as an amendment if it's uh, appropriate, uh, Your Worship. Seconder. I'll second it. Uh, discussion on the amendment? We, we can't really do that because um, I have a budget document that already reflects these recommendations, which is why it's coming first. So the recommendations in the staff report as being funded from uh, gas tax and or um, money that was put into a training reserve at 2013 year end, et cetera, are all reflected in this budget document, which is hopefully going to receive first, second, third reading tonight. So I think we need to be more clear, and the staff recommendation I do not have a problem with as to funding source. 
Councillor Collington. Thank you. That that actually was sort of the question that, that I had in that I'm I actually have sort of no problem leaving it in the hands of staff to, to find the best sources of funding, but how does that work with the, the budget process? Um, and I'm I'm wondering through the chair slightly looking at Councillor Logan whether we should um, at very least kind of minimise the ask out of the gas tax fund by at l very least directing the sidewalk funds to cover part of that um, cost. Yep. Um, so perhaps we, if you, I don't know if you wanted to kind of withdraw the motion and put a new one on the table or we can just how you wanted to and redo it. vote it down and, and redo. Uh, well, I'll just withdraw my Uh, the to to the mayor, uh, you know the alternate, and I would uh, direct this question to the director of finance. Uh, what would the impact be if we were to table uh, that next resolution on the five-year budget? What would the impact do for timelines? It would put us back significantly because staff are already heavily involved in the audit, the year-end, the parcel tax panel, calculating the parcel tax rate as well as the user fee so if we have to continue to focus on the budget for um, at least the next two council meetings and that delay our budget to about the end of middle to the end of April our statutory deadline is 14 of May Mr. Collington. So I would move an amendment to the motion which says be modified to reassign an additional 77,000 in funding, um, including $21,000, 21, $21, I wish, $21,000 from the sidewalk fund and 46,000 from the gas tax fund. I will um, second that. Currently assigned to the Kelly Soup project, et cetera. Forty-six <laughs> or fifty-six? Forty. Fifty-six. My apologies. Can't do math. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to the director of that finance, thank you for covering my butt. Just Councillor Day, a question um, on that. Another way around having to change all the numbers that are in a, an item that's already in. Uh, been included in the agenda tonight would be to direct the $21,000 in the sidewalk fund to the Kelly and Soup Road improvements, which definitely will include sidewalk. I mean, that's that's one of the big issues there as well. Um, it just There's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned by any alteration on here where what position it puts us going forward um, for the balance of, you know, for, for those bylaws that are, are coming up. Um, Councillor Martin? I don't care where the money comes from. Uh, it seems like we're just mm -hmm. sort of moving, we're, yeah. we're playing a shell game here with that. I guess I, I have a different question though and I need to clarify it. We approve $30,000. Was that the original budget, or was that that we were just putting? So, like, are we saying the budget is is two hundred, three hundred percent off? Is that was that what we're saying? That, I mean, that's that's a little more than. Yeah, the proposal to build that uh, sidewalk came up during a TMPI meeting, huh. and I suspect that the budget was sort of thrown about in that meeting, and and never updated. And that, that's where the problem came in, that you know, you come up off the top of your head in the meeting with a number, but then when you actually go and look at you know, the standard to which we're doing these things with landscaping and everything, I mean, you could build, probably build the sidewalk for some number close to that, but not the curbs and the uh, landscaping and everything. So I'm sorry, how are we then, uh, through the chair, uh, to our to our director, how are we catching this then in the future? Because that just seems like that's a that's a huge difference in 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 a budget 
Terry Pro like and I and I understand overruns and all that, but that, that's a huge underestimation of of a project and and I understand staffing yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff, but that just I mean we should have some expertise on um, something like that, that the cost wise. Yeah, basically the the process was too informal. We need a more formal process where it goes through more than one person and everybody signs off so that it's checked instead of, you know, being created in a meeting and then it's just, you know, nobody uh, checked it. Through the chair to Councillor uh, Logan, uh, it was my understanding that the Ackland uh, to school uh, portion of the project was not previously approved, that that is a new ask. So yeah. when you're looking at the almost $300,000, it involves that, that ask. Mm. So I, I know it's uh, still not appropriate to have a 200% increase on, on an estimation, um, but we, we do take out that $56,000. Th there was errors in, in the calculation on the estimation. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see further benchmarking of this sort of activity. If we're going to undertake these activities uh, internally, that we ask other municipalities and contractors and, and have a running cost total benchmarking of sorts on various different projects, whether it be concrete or asphalt. And I understand the significance of doing it internally when there's a lack of uh, contractors, you know, in concrete. Uh, you know, it's very hard to get them for small projects. So th there is an advantage on the short term and long term by our employees being engaged in learning uh, this process and technique. But albeit there were errors made, and I do uh, applaud staff for, for taking that responsibility and not pointing blame elsewhere. But there are other things that we can do, such as benchmarking, financial reporting, uh, variance reporting as well. Uh, the director had made the, the suggestion to uh, have quarterly reporting, and I further uh, uh, commented that uh, staff have uh, availability of these reports monthly, and there should be more accountability on to the directors to provide that information on the variances back to the director so that we're working more of a team on this process and effort to uh, be more accurate on our estimation. I take full responsibility. <laughs> no, it was Chris's fault. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are at um, Um, looking, yeah. yeah, so we have an amendment on the floor, uh, for, in, pardon? Um, it is, go Gordy on that one again. The amendment on the floor deals with, um, instead of taking 77,000 from gas tax, taking 21,000 of that from the sidewalk budget. Um, I have a, a question through the chair to the director of finance in terms of what does that does that um, does that mess up the the budget for tonight? Um, in which case, I would consider withdrawing the motion. Um, I, I thought Councillor Day had a, a sensible suggestion, um, which would allow us to move forward with the original motion as presented. No, as long as the. Uh tangible capital assets in the five-year uh, bylaw uh, do not change. And as long as the other, sorry, I can't see. As long as the, um, the grouping of the revenue do not change, then we're okay. <clears throat> because, um, the gas or the deferred revenue for gas tax and the sidewalk fund are both deferred revenue. So whether you take it from gas tax or sidewalk, it's the dollar value. If the dollar value changes, then the budget document changes. I'm Thank visualizing you. the clock in Marcy's video. <laughs> yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My motion stands. <laughs> Okay, call the question then on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion does carry. 
Um, so do we just, what do we have to do with our main, 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 motion. main motion then? Main motion as amended. Main motion as amended. <laughs> I'm like passing it twice. So main motion as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Third res resolution. Um, so oh, I'll shut my mic off. That doesn't help. Um, the third resolution then is a piece that was not considered previously. Um, it is the sidewalk from Ackland Road right through to Wishart Elementary School. Um, the pros of that are it would fully complete complete the project and, pr and provide that safe route to school. Um, so certainly something that we would want to see happen. Um, the question for council is, do you want to see it happen sort of now, this year as part of this project, um, and take the money out of gas tax, which is $56,000, um, or you can choose to, to vote it down, in which case it will reappear down the road in a... In a um, as a, as a future wish. So, it was recommended by committee and I so move that the 2014 budget be modified to reassign an additional 56,000 in gas tax funding from the Kelly Soup project for construction of a sidewalk from Ackland Road to, but not including, the Wishart Elementary School frontage with early budget approval. Second. Second. Uh, discussion? Yes, Dr. Martin. Uh, just really quickly, uh, I, I just want to make sure we're, we're comfortable with all these numbers now that these numbers are, should be fairly accurate, that we're not going to have a 200% increase. Yeah, we, we don't like to make the same mistake twice. Yes. I, 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 you, get it, you get it once. Yeah. <laughs> Any other members of council? Councilor Day? Thank you. Uh, my question was just to um, what exactly uh, this entails, because from Ackland Road to the school is in front of two houses. Um, from Ackland Road to the sidewalk or the crosswalk that goes to the school is two houses and a large parking lot. Um, so I just want to know, I want to clarify what does that $56,000 get us? Are we talking about sidewalk in front of two houses? Um, yeah, that's a uh, sidewalk uh, curb, landscaping, trees, and uh, um, a little bit of drainage work. I think uh, then um, that is important to uh, support it being finished for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is um, to ensure that the sidewalk area doesn't become a parking area, as is happening in front of a number of other schools in the area uh, where we have the asphalt curbs. Um, people just drive around them and park on top of where the sidewalk area is. So I think as a safe route to school and maintaining clear sight lines for kids coming and going, cycling and so forth, uh, it's important to finish the project. Um, I will say though that um, I am concerned that what started as, you know, maybe a $100,000 project has turned into a $300,000 project. And had we known that starting out, we might have chosen a different area um, to focus on but let's finish it let's make it good and and let's um, make sure that uh, we get good value for that investment Councillor Lukens if that's the case I just want to make sure there's not going to be any weeds in there there's pride in that development now <laughs> don't have to call the question any further conversation Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. And one more. One, one final um, recommendation. Um, this is the, the piece dealing with the, the go forward. Recommended by committee, and I so move that the engineering department with cooperation from the finance department undertakes improvements to estimating and cost tracking in general, and particularly with regard to the public works division. Need that seconder. Second. Second. Um, any Comments, questions? I think it's all been said. Yep. Here's where the rubber hits the road. So um, with that, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, we can move then back to finance and administration. 
Uh, item 7.1, it is on our current agendas. Uh, report building inspector three in regards to 418B, Goldstream work without permit. this, but I think it's more appropriate that the city engineer does. Because I saw Pat poking, or pointing. I saw lips moving, but I couldn't read them. I lost my uh, agenda there in the computer. Um, yeah, this is um, a case where uh, a new owner found that the previous owner had uh, cut some roof trusses in the building, um, which means that the uh, the roof will tend to suffer problems over uh, over time, um, and the uh, the work was done without a permit. Now the current owner is just not in a financial position to do anything about this, um, uh, and. Although she has had an engineer look at it, so she does have an idea of what the problem is. Um, and in that case, um, you know, there's no point in the municipality taking a an enforcement approach to having the work done, um, since the roof is is functioning for now. It will suffer over the long term. Um, but in order to protect itself, what the municipality can do is to put, file notice on title so that property cannot be sold without a new owner knowing that there's a problem. And it's an acknowledgement uh, by both the owner and the municipality that we know there's something wrong there and that it's the, um, the owner's duty to fix it. I move the recommendation. Second. Uh, comments, questions from council? Seeing none, yes? Uh, our corporate officer at one point said that people could speak on on these. Uh, should we ask if the person's in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. And are I'm they allowed? I'm not aware that the um, affected. No, no, but it's the same thing. Speak on yeah, them. yeah. I'm not aware that that person's here. Per person's here okay. or whatever um, in this. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate set of circumstances, that's for sure, um, in this case. But uh, I see that through the correspondence provided to us that she is looking um, to resolve this through a number of means. Um, yeah. Yes, Councilor I, I guess, you know, and this is probably beyond our scope, but um, I don't know how long ago she bought the property, but I believe that if something wasn't disclosed during the purchase, because you're supposed to disclose any of that, that she would have some recourse um, from you know the sale perspective, so she may want to entertain that as well. Yeah, it, it it's in here. She bought the home in November, um, and she's trying to get compensation to correct this issue, none of which was ever disclosed to me on the non-disclosure nor picked up by the inspector. So um, I know of another incident close to where I live where a similar situation occurred, um, and they were successful. It was a bit of a battle but they were eventually um, successful in, in getting compensation for the damage that was um, apparent in there. So um, with that, call the question that is before us in that recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the next item is, um, again, work without permit, request for notice. Uh, we do have the individuals in the audience here. This is the 2997 Charlotte uh, location. Um, again, do we want to have introduction from you, Michael, and then we can have uh, folks speak to it? So um, this revolves around some safety issues regarding the uh, creation of a suite, and um, these safety issues all arise out of the code requirements uh, for a suite. And uh, some of them are fire-related um, issues, so um, you know they're important to life safety. And uh, um, I gather that the uh, notice on title is being considered because of the length of time that this issue has 
um, not received sufficient attention to resolve it. Um, but I gather that the uh, the applicant uh, would like to address that part of the matter this evening. Do we have specific questions to this individual, or do you want to hear more counsel? Any question? Anything that you want to say on this one, Andre? Yes. Uh, I suppose everyone has to have the DHA inspection for to for the permit to proceed. So I have not had uh, the final inspection from the DHA. The field will be done by the end of the month. To technically, I don't have a permit according to your law, your standards, because VIA is supposed to approve before a permit can be issued. Then, so you call it. But I had proceeded wrongfully in, in, in doing this suite. The smoke detectors are in place toward, in the whole house, in all the bedrooms. My only question is the smoke detector that has to go into the furnace. I've talked to different furnace companies, and they believe this does not apply for a residential suite. And as for a conversation that I had with Ron North in July, I asked him about this, telling him that I would be the first one in Victoria to have one. He told me not to push this matter, and I just want to know what that meant. Is that a threat, or? What? I'm just wondering why this has to be installed. It's a very expensive item. I'm just curious why for a residential. Is there a need for more conversation between this individual and staff before we're at it's this? A, it's not going to do any harm. I don't think there's a tearing hurry here. If, uh, if we can engender some more conversation that might make everybody happy. Okay. Councillor Dave? I'm sure that uh, if we move forward and maybe staff could give clarification with the recommendation here and subsequently staff and the resident are, are able to um, resolve those issues that um, staff could at any point in time determine that those uh, requirements have been met and not carried on with putting a a notice on on the title uh, which uh, certainly would be good and beneficial from our point of view I certainly know that uh, I don't know the specifics of this case whatsoever or at all but I know that in my own home I have um, a smoke detector in my furnace room just to be extra Does safe it shut your furnace off I have no idea couldn't no, tell you yeah. this is what it's supposed to do it's supposed to be inside the furnace yeah. So I'm, as I say, I don't know any of the ins and outs. I'm just saying that I'm quite certain that our staff are, are going to ask for all the right things and uh, that if they're being complied with uh, and we have made this resolution here tonight, um, that all the right pieces can still fall into place after, after the deadline. And I also been asked to pay for a permit to start again for the following year, so I don't understand why. If I apply for a, and paid for another permit for another year round, why is this coming to council right now? This is twice I paid for this permit. Once last year and it been requested on January 7th to repay for a new permit, and I have. Councillor Harvey. Uh, thank you through the chair. I would uh, most certainly support staff and the applicant getting together and trying to resolve these issues before we actually uh, go down this road. Mm -hmm. So differ. Then we need that. <laughs> so in, in, in that light, I will move to defer this item. Second. Uh, any further discussion on the deferment? Councillor Day? Point of clarification, when are we deferring it to next council? Uh, next council will be the 24th of March. Will that be sufficient time, two weeks, to uh, yeah, try the, and, and work through this? That should be uh, no problem for us to have a conversation with the, uh, 
of the uh, property owner and uh, come back with something either saying that there is a timetable for everything to be resolved or, or that there isn't. Good. Call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Aye. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. So you, that means you are to be in touch with our staff and set that up and we'll talk to you again at the end of the month. Um, third item report uh, regarding the 2014 AVICC annual general meeting and conven convention. Um, Councillor Martin, are you going to go on this one or yeah. you're going to hand it off? You were you were going to or no, not? I was not going to. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Well, it's come that time. Um, AVICC is coming up rapidly here in April, um, the 11th through 13th. Traditionally, we've had um, a couple of members of council attend. Um, last year, we were fortunate; we had three. Uh, Councillor Lukens, Day, and myself were there in attendance to the event out in Soup. This year, it is up in Qualicum Parksville, um, and so we need to know and be able to register uh, with this um, event to um, ensure that we have some representation there. Uh, so we have a choice before us. Um, because it does have some financial implications of where and the money would come from the council training and, and uh, conventions uh, budgets. And the recommendation before you um, is that the approval be, be granted for two members of council to attend the AVICC AGM and convention to be held in Qualicum Beach Parksville April 8th, 11th through 13th, um, approximately $2,000 equaling $1,000 per person considering that they're away, uh, taken from the council training conferences convention fees account. Um, Councillor uh, Day, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just think uh, I'll give you a, a brief bit of history. We didn't uh, used to participate in the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities chapter of, um, of the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Uh, uh, for many years, COWID belonged to the Union of British Columbia Municipalities alone, and um, sort of through a loophole um, uh, by not submitting resolutions to the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities, um, the city of COWID saved a few hundred dollars every year by not participating. And uh, what came as a result of that was that there was um, fewer opportunities for us to network with other Vancouver Island communities. There were fewer opportunities for us to lay any groundwork <laughs> for any um, other municipal supporters of, of issues that we wanted to bring to the attention of the provincial government <coughs> and uh, fewer opportunities for us to really um, gain any traction at the Union of British Columbia Municipalities annual general meeting, which um, council members have been attending uh, as they're <coughs> able to over the years. Um, so to sum it up, really, I think it's important. Um, for many years, I attended AVICC because other people were not able to through um, work commitments and otherwise. It, um, it does take you away from home and uh, mm -hmm. does require a considerable amount of time and attention. And um, you come home tired and overwhelmed with information. Um, but it is really beneficial mm -hmm. to the city um, <coughs> to have someone advocating for Colwood um, within the Vancouver Island community and learning um, f about other initiatives uh, nearby. Um, and I think it was very um, useful for Councillor Lukens and the Mayor and myself when we attended in soup last year. Um, on, as a sideline, um, that's when I learned to use Twitter, thanks to <coughs> Councillor Lukens. Uh, she signed me up, she showed me how to do it, uh, which is great, and uh, still, still, still making use of it. Um, and uh, I've also had an opportunity to talk to councillors from Esquimalt, councillors from Victoria, 
to talk about getting island representation uh, in UBCM. Uh, in fact, the Capital Regional District um, is very underrepresented uh, both at AVICC and at UBCM. Um, so uh, I would just put it out there that um, if we need to um, increase the budget to make this uh, a possibility, if there's enough people who want to, to go, um, uh, I would be in favor of doing that. If council is in favor of only sending uh, a small delegation of people, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to support whoever wants to go and it really doesn't need to be me. I've gone because someone needed to go in the past. Um, so I, I'm very supportive of um, people going to this and the more people we have, the more opportunity we have to actually um, uh, do some lobbying uh, for the programs and services that the citizens of Colwood uh, really need us to um, to implement. So what I do need is somebody to move and uh, second this recommendation. I'll move and it. then we should also have a discussion on who those second. two members will be um, at that table. So Councillor Lukens? We Unfortunately, have did no, I moved it and person? Gordy seconded it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go this year, um, although I have to say I found great value in it last year and absolutely support someone or a couple of people from our council going. Um, it's a lot of work. They're long days, but the speakers were absolutely amazing last year and a real eye-opener on many instances about some of the things that are happening in and around us and impacting us. So it is important that we as a city uh, are represented and that we're able to send um, a couple of people to it. Andrew Cullington. Thank you. I'm also not able to to attend. Um, and what I did want to throw out there is, if um, if we have two councillors able to attend, I think that's that's fabulous. Um, do we also want to consider the possibility of asking the CAO if he wants to attend some or all of it? Because I think there may also be value. We talked there. about that last mm -hmm. year, actually yeah. and having uh, the CAO and the value of uh, having someone mm -hmm. from staff there. So. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that he has family obligations to meet as well. Well, the CAO actually came the year before. Yeah. So that was in that. Um, uh, and and so I'm going to. We've got the mover and, and seconder on there. Um, I would like to, although I've I've had great um, experience there. Again, I'm out of town in that weekend, <coughs> not returning until the 13th. So it takes me out of the equation. But there is. Uh, a opportunity being built around that same time frame for communities with economic development to um, perhaps get together and do some brainstorming and that sort of thing. And so with that, um, I'd like to suggest that Councillor Harvey be considered as, or pardon me, Sullivan. Yeah, that's okay. It's because I had to do her password today and that hasn't been changed. Um, and uh, it, uh, if she's available, it might be a benefit. It has not been confirmed um, yet, but it, it would certainly give a great opportunity for her uh, to start a, a network in that field. So now that she's back to the table, I brought that up to you. So that's the 11th through the 13th of April in Parksville. I am available. Okay, so that will be suggestion one, and I will leave it to the table to come up with a second one, or someone volunteer. If uh, we've heard some nays around here, so I recommend Cynthia or Councillor Day and Councillor Sullivan to go, if they're available. Councillor Day, is that going to work on your schedule too? Okay, so so we have two two councillors' uh, names put forward um, in part of that. So seeing that there and no other takers, um, Councillor Logan? Did we decide on uh, sending well, the CAO we, as well? Is that well, and then we have to follow that up with the CAO. A separate motion? Yeah, okay. yeah. So we'll do that separately. So we have uh, the motion before us with the two councillors being Councillor Day and, and uh, Sullivan. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carried. And now entertain a motion about our CAO making himself available. 
So I would move um, that we support um, staff attending AVICC um, if, if they are available. Second. To the mayor and council. Um, I, I'm uh, free, uh, however, given time away from uh, a new position here. I, I see the value uh, in, in going, but also doing my job here. Uh, looking at reducing expend, uh, expenses such as hotels and accommodations, etc. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity for me to participate. Maybe on one day that is more significant than the others. Uh, a lot of these, uh, there's a lot of networking. Yes, mm -hmm. that's very important. However, um, there might be some very good components on one of the days. I would like to look at the agenda and you know provide that insight. Um, there might be two days, so may require some accommodations, but uh, to speak on all three at this time without looking at the full agenda, and it's very difficult for me right now, but uh, I could make myself available if required. I think the vote uh, simply puts the um, ask in front and, and uh, support for that. So uh, anybody else? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Um, you know the motion was that you were going to sleep in your car, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, okay, 7.1.4 discussion, Director of Finance, in regards to budget bylaw number 1534. We're nearly there. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the reason this has been put on the agenda is that since the last time Council uh, basically gave the approval for the a five-year financial plan there have been a couple minor amendments none of which have an impact on taxation a few projects such as the ones this evening have been added to the budget and there's been a corresponding decrease to the budget in another uh, project Kelly Road so this is just to let you have a look at it before you see it in the budget bylaw later tonight so there's no required resolution. This one didn't come with anything from staff on it. So it's just uh, information? Yes, so that when you, uh, if you choose to give first, second, third reading of the budget bylaw, you're aware that it has changed from the last time you've seen it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any members of council with a question to our director of finance in regards to what's before you? Seeing none, then a motion perhaps to receive that. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Moving then through to bylaws, which is our first one, 8.1, one, uh, one four, first, second, and third readings. Move introduction. Second. Sorry, just what, which bylaw are you on? 1534? The, the first one. The first, the ver first one. Okay, got you. Thank you. Uh, so we have mover and seconder. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Move Mo second. Second, second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Understood. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, bylaw number 1522, final reading. Can't Cold land use bylaw number 151, 1989 amendment number 134, uh, 31, or 2132, and 2138 Suk Road. Move introduction. No, nope, it's oh, final. Sorry, move final. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, bylaw number 1531, final reading. Cold main sewer local area service bylaw. Establishment and loan authorization bylaw number. 598 2001 amendment number 19 Second. all those in favor opposed motion carried motion to adjourn move adjournment second all those in favor opposed <laughs> motion carried